Thank you for that, Rolf. I love the first song that we sang, You Are Amazing God. And how true these words are. Jesus is truly amazing. Well, good morning, church. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to be here this morning. And if you are new to this church, welcome. I hope that you make this church your, your home. Uh, before I start, I'd like to pray. Father, the greatest joy that we could ever have in this life and in the life to come is to know you. I just ask your blessing upon all of us here this morning. Father, for you alone are worthy and for you alone are to be glorified and that's the reason that we are here this morning. Father, help me. Help me. Go before me, Father. Not my words, but let your words be heard. I just ask out of your goodness, Father God, that you bless every, that you bless every single person, person that has come down here to worship you. Amen. There is so much to this paragraph, I'm unable to cover it all this morning. When I asked Jonathan, Jonathan, what do you want me to talk about? He reckons, just talk about Jesus. <laughs> so I figured he was playing it safe. David, just talk about Jesus and you'll be right. <laughs> okay, so I'll do my best, okay? <laughs> One of the points of this paragraph is virtually to rejoice in the Lord and not in yourself. Our joy comes from knowing God. Paul, Paul again reminds the Philippians that they need to rejoice and admits that he has told them about these things and other issues before. Yet he also, rem he also realizes it is necessary to remind them. It's a, way, it's a way of protection. We need to hear the same truth over and over again. Uh, sometimes we are forgetful and a reminder is, is a good way to put us back on, tr on track. That's what Jonathan does with a lot of his teaching. It sort of re keeps repeating itself. It's virtually a reminder so that we can really get to know what the Word is telling us. And not so much to get to know, but it actually sticks with us. Okay. Now, it's also interesting, actually, as, as I was looking this up, actually, the word reminder or, or to remember or curse 227 times in the Bible. I could just imagine the guy going through the Bible. There's one here, there's one down there. It must have been a really long process, you know. So it is really important. Um, basically, what was happening in Philippians, there was a group of people running around putting their confidence in the flesh during this time. And, to, and what that actually means, to put confidence in the flesh, is to rely on one's own accomplishment for serving God, for salvation. Um, they were saying that they needed to be, the circumcision was needed and to keep the law of Moses in order to belong to God. In other words, they were saying, okay, you can believe in Jesus, but you also need to uh, keep the law. You've got to become a Jew and do all the things that's required, and then you can believe in Jesus. So Paul writes these, to these Christians about the things keeping them safe in error. Uh, these people that um, Paul calls dogs and evil doers and millipedes of the flesh, these are pretty strong words, actually. Can you imagine someone gets the gospel and they just had one little part and says, you look at these dogs and evildoers, you know? They're uh, pretty strong words. There were false teachers trusting in the works of men rather than the grace of God. In other words, they were saying, look at me. Look, look what I'm doing. It was basically work-based. These false teachers... They fail to see by keeping the law, it gives men the glory instead of God. You become self-righteous. These who trust in their own works really don't need Jesus. They might know something about Jesus, but you know, I'm working my way towards him. Adding works seems like a small and even a helpful addition to the gospel, but this makes the gospel man-centered and neglects the need for Christ. Uh, we, we are to put our confidence in Christ and not in ourselves. To put confidence in Christ is to put no confidence in my own ability to, to contribute anything to salvation. There's nothing that I can virtually do. And Paul argues, if a person can be saved by the law, except Paul himself was the one. By Judaism's own standard, 
He is the, he is the ultimate Jew, as we heard in verse 5 and 6. He, he outlines his achievements and then afterwards considered them as garbage that he may gain Christ and be found in him. Now, Paul concludes before salvation, he considered these things valuable. There's nothing wrong with these things in themselves. There's nothing wrong with the, the things that we achieve, you know. But when you compare them to Christ, it is, it is literally just a whole lot of rubbish. Afterwards, Paul considered the, these things as loss. Uh, they led him further away from God. Uh, what was truly important, it led him further from Christ because it caused him to become prideful in his own achievements. It caused him to rely on himself instead of putting faith in Christ. So this is what basically works do. Also, when you think that you accomplish something and you start bragging about, look what I've done, I've done this and done that, these things don't really make much difference in, in the light of Christ. And I think that's what basically Paul is telling us. So Paul says that the list of his accomplishments and achievements are nothing in the Christian perspective. This is what it, what it means to say to live in Christ and to die is our gain. When we die to ourselves, we gain Christ. I like to look at it this way. When I think of myself, what do I get? I get self. When I think of Jesus, what do I get? Jesus. In verse 9, Paul, having uh, expressed his dependency upon the grace of God for, for the righteousness, now in verse 10, Paul deals with the benefits of knowing Christ and what it is to be found in him. This is Paul's main desire, and his main desire is to know Christ. Now, <clears throat> I heard someone say, right, that too many, too many Christians envision the good news as a kind of a get out of the hell card. Jesus saves from sin. Jesus grants us access to heaven, end of the story, so I can do whatever I like. The gospel I have promises us so much more than a pleasant place to spend in eternity. It promises us Jesus Christ. Failing to understand the greatness of such a promise can only mean that the gospel itself is not understood. Yes, Jesus is both the means and the goal of the gospel. And I thought this was a really sobering thought. A lot of people want the blessings of Jesus. Do you want Jesus? That is my question. In Matthew chapter, chapter 13, verse 30, uh, 44, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. A man finds it and then he covers it up with joy. He's really happy that he found the treasure. He goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. In this short parable, the person, the person sells all that he has for the joy of finding the treasure. He quickly forfeits all that he has for the opportunity to know the tr treasure. In the same way, this is what Paul is telling us. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and being conformed to his death. Sometimes when it comes to God's word, we need to stop and dig, and dig deep to find its treasure. My focus today is on verse 10. And before I start, why is the re resurrection of Jesus Christ so important? Christianity is not a religion based on abstract principles. Christianity is about a personal living relationship with a living Savior, that, that you can get to know him now and personally. A Savior who infuses his life with our, who enables us to do his will and who transforms us into his likeness. Without this, there is no Christianity. Verse 10, we can roughly break up into three sections. The first one is, is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. The second one, sharing his suffering. 
and the third one to be conformed to his death. Now, I'm not going to say it. I was going to say the point is, right, we need to know all of these, all of these for us to fully to know who Jesus is. It does not matter if you are a new Christian or an old one. We all need to grow in the knowledge of who? Jesus. There are several crucial, crucial reasons why this is so important. And this morning I'll just give you one, and we all should be very well familiar with this verse. The Bible defines internal life as what? Knowing, Jesus, knowing God for the person of Jesus Christ. If you want to know Jesus and live forever in heaven with him, the first thing you do is you get to know Jesus. <laughs> I, think, I think it's so simple. But the Apostle Paul doesn't just stop in simply knowing Jesus. Instead, he also adds another phrase, and the power of his resurrection. Now, the gospel is not simply knowing the Bible or some facts about Jesus. Jesus it is to be transformed by it. Knowing Christ and the power that raised Christ from the dead is what transforms us into his image. We should, we should begin with a reminder again that is, it is almost impossible to overstate the importance of the power that raised Jesus from the dead. In Corinthians 1, 15, verse 15.15, Paul bluntly states, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. Without resurrection, there is no Christianity. There is no hope for us to be free from our sins and if, if Christ has not been raised from the grave. The gospel depends upon the re resurrection of Jesus Christ. The death is just as important as the resurrection, but this morning I'm just focusing on his resurrection. What can be more powerful than that? There is no greater truth upon the face of the earth that we can compare to this. And I think I mentioned this once in my com communion. To know that God himself died for the sins of his rebellious creatures and rose from the dead, displaying his power for all to see. There is no truth greater than this. But the question, uh, question you might be asking yourself this morning or the question that I've been asking myself, how can we know the power of Jesus' resurrection? Jesus is not going to tell us to do something without actually knowing how to do it or doesn't supply the power to do it. In Romans 8-11, it says, it gives, us, it gives us a bit of a clue. There are other scriptures we can go to, but I like this one anyway. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through the spirit who dwells in you. The Holy Spirit, dwells, the Holy spirit of God dwells within an every believer. He gives spiritual life in Christ now, here and now, and also eternal life in Christ in the ages to come, which we will have, which we will have when, when we have new resurrected bodies, which are enabling us to live in the presence of God. In other words, these bodies will be free from sin. Christians know the power of this resurrection because it is the very power that is that it, it, because it is the very power which saves us from being dead in sin. The power of his resurrection is a life-giving spirit. That means that these who are, who are conformed with Jesus will receive the same resurrection life as his. The power of his resurrection is also a justifying power made right with God. It, it is it is the proof that the sacrifice of, of the cross was accepted as a payment in full for our redemption. Now, note that knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection are intertwined with one another. This is no accident on Paul's part. Rather, Christ cannot be known apart from also knowing the power of his resurrection. Now, if you only know a little bit about me, you don't really know me. 
You need to know everything about me. That's what Christ is telling us here. And now people, now Paul doesn't just stop knowing Christ and his resurrection. Knowing Jesus is also knowing his suffering. Which, is, which was a big part of Jesus' life. In Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, he, Jesus is portrayed as a suffering servant, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. He suffered, his suffering is to be understood in the content of doing God's will. We suffer because of sin and because we live in a fallen world. But Christ suffered in doing God's will. There is, a different, there is a difference between simply suffering and sharing in Christ's suffering. Christ's suffering is different because it arises out of our union and association with him. Sometimes it comes to us when the gospel is proclaimed. And we can see this in Acts uh, chapter 5, verse 41, when Peter the Apostle was beaten and forbidden to speak in the name of Jesus, and they left the place... Of, rejoicing that they were worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. So true Christianity is not an easy sell. We don't call people, people for a crown, but we call people to the cross. Early on in, early on in chapter 12, Paul, Paul says, For to you it has been granted on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. So we are called to have faith in Jesus Christ, but just in the same way we are called to suffer for him. Suffering for our faith is not new. It is to be expected, and suffering comes to, comes to us in different ways. In Jesus' days, many people rejected Jesus and his message. Often with great violence, often with great violence, Jesus predicted that that his disciples would suffer the same suffering as he suffered. In John 15, 12, he says, Remember, remember what I told you. A, ser a servant is not greater than his master. If they prosecute me, they will prosecute you. I suppose living in Australia, we don't even know what, what does it mean to suffer for Jesus. The way, the way that is done, just go and proclaim the gospel to your neighbor. God proclaimed the gospel to those they haven't heard, and I think we'll start to understand what does it mean to suffer for Jesus. But no one really likes suffering, do we? Do you like suffering? Ah, come on, <laughs> be truthful. No one likes to suffer. But out of bad things, God works it for our good. We come to know him better when we share his suffering. Through suffering, we are meant to go deeper in our relationship with Jesus Christ. You get to know a person better when you know everything that they have experienced. In other places, this is called the fellowship of suffering. We have something in common to share with Christ. And I reckon that is absolutely brilliant. That there is, there is a privilege to go and suffer the same suffering as Christ is. So, the, so in a sense, we have some common fellowship with one another. What a privilege it is to suffer for Jesus. And Paul has mentioned this hundreds of times in the Bible. Maybe not hundreds, but I'm pretty sure quite a bit. Now, if you think suffering was pretty bad, eh? what about death? This takes me to my last point. To know Christ is to be conformed to his death. I don't know about you, but I love that. <laughs> Before we can experience Christ's resurrection and suffering, we need to die to self. In Romans chapter 3, in Romans 6 verse 3, it says, do, do you not know that as many as you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death? This happens when you first became a Christian. And I remember my first experience uh, when I became a Christian six months into my relationship with Christ. I went, I went to paradise. And I, I shared this at home church. 
I went to paradise and I saw uh, and um, a lot of people were getting baptized. And to be quite honest, I really found it offensive, you know. I'm never going to do this, you know. I'm never going to do this what these people were doing. Anyway, two, le- two weeks later, the Holy Spirit said to me, David, go and get baptized. Automatically, I obeyed without any questions whatsoever. Anyway, so when, so when it came to baptize me, as we do down here, occasionally on Sunday mornings, the person goes down in water and comes up. But what happened to me, actually, when I went in the water, it came out of the water, I died to myself. I felt like I died. I'm not living anymore. It's like my life at that time was virtually hidden in Christ. If we are going to know Christ, we must identify with his death. When Christ died, we died. When he rose, he rose. As we confirm to as we conform to his death, we become self sacrificing. All that Christ did, what did he do? He did it for God. He did it for the other person. He never done anything for himself. So so in being conformed to his death, we live not for ourselves, but we live for Christ. And I also put on here too, we also live for our brothers and sisters who are in Christ. In living for others, this is what puts us to death. Now, the good news is, right, doesn't happen overnight. This, takes a, this, this is a lifelong process. It is called taking up your cross. Now, what is misunderstood about this, actually, and a lot of people don't find dying to self very pleasant, but to be quite honest, it is quite enjoyable. In a sense, when I die, what happens, what happens after death? comes the resurrection. <laughs> if, if we enter his death through, through baptism, right, then the same power that raised Jesus from the dead from the dead will be in us. We will, we will rise with him in the newest of life. We experience new things. We're doing things that we haven't done before. Resurrection life flows as we die to our old self. Being conformed to his death, it's what gives us life. This is what it means to follow Jesus, as far as I can understand from from the Bible. And as we approach Easter, this is where Christ is heading, and this is what it means to follow Jesus, is to die to yourself and not to do your own will, but to do the will of him who called you. I will just finish up with a quick summary. I've got to make it poli- biblically correct. <laughs> Philippians 3, 1, is, this is a bit of a summary. Philippians 3, one, 3, 3 to 1 to 10. Um, uh, Christians, Christians, are, Christians, are, Christians can be influenced by false false teachers, particularly these who, who, who add legalism on top of the gospel. Paul describes his, his uh, impressive credentials, shows that he, if anyone can be right with God, uh, it is himself, according, according to the Jewish standard. And yet, in the light of Christ, Paul sees all his accomplishments as, as, as garbage that he may gain Christ. Faith alone saves, and knowing Christ is what truly matters. And I would just like to finish off, what does this mean for us? What does this teach us? We must teach our flesh, ourselves, that Christ is more delightful, much more than anything that we could ever imagine. I would just like to finish off with that. Let's pray. Father, I know sometimes it's hard. It's hard. We say that we know you, Father, but sometimes, sometimes we need to know you all the more. 
I just pray, Father God, as we give to you, as we give ourselves to yourself, that you come to us and we will learn and to know what it is to die to yourself and that our lives are hidden in Christ and that we will be raised to the newest of life. I pray, Father, help us to see things in a different perspective because Jesus died and rose again from the grave. Amen.